Hi everybody, my name is Ed Friedman. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Chairman of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. I don't think we have any other board members here right now. Um, but you can ask me any questions about what we do. Kathleen McGee's here in the back there. You can ask her as well. She's been on the board for years and been our interim director for years. Um, so, um, it's quite a blue light in my eyes here. Why, why did it, let's uh, do something about that. Uh oh, come on, come on. Where's that nice picture you had? There we go, all right, that's a little bit better. All right, so um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Friends of Mary Mini Bay for those of you that don't know, um, but I'm gonna get this basket going around first. This series costs us well over $1,000 to put on every year, and Patagonia and Freeport helps us by donating some product to incentivize a door prize. So if you would care to put some money in the basket, like five bucks or something, write your name on a little, piece of scrap paper and put it in the tin. I'll pass that around. Um, we've got a couple of door prizes tonight. A hat, it's a little, oh, even bluer hat now, right? And a little bag thing. So, we've got pretty good odds. Um, so we are a unique group, um, we do, um, we're a land trust, but we also do a lot of research, advocacy work, and education work. And if you look at the trifolds that we have set up on the tables and on the floor, those are some good examples of what we do. And uh, a few just direct examples. Um, we, we're also, our perspective is a holistic perspective. There's no sense in protecting a piece of land if you're not ensuring that the water going by it is clean and the critters are around that should be there, the indigenous or native wildlife. Um, and then who's gonna do it when we're gone? It's gonna be the kids. So um, this morning I filed a, uh, uh, an objection and comments with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission over a uh, project down in Westbrook on the Presumpscot River, connected to us via the Gulf of Maine, that is a surrender application to take the dam down in Westbrook. And there's a, a group of, a couple of cons quote conservation groups that in secret agreement with the power company, the paper company, um, decided to, the dam's gonna come down for sure. They're gonna get a fish passage in the river besides, because the bedrock's been altered so much of 200 years of dams there. But they're trading off passage at two dams above there between Westbrook and Sebago Lake. Be no more fish passage. So 70% of the watershed will be no more fish in exchange for a gourmet fish ladder on the side of this former dam. So there's a few of us, friends of Sebago, friends of Mary Meeting, that are saying, wait, now wait a minute. That's not a fair trade. So we do stuff like that. Um, we've uh, protected a piece of land up in Dresden. Took about five years to protect the most significant prehistoric archeological site in the state. And, uh, um, along with that unique for uh, one of the rare plant species in Mary Meeting Bay, of which there are a dozen. Um, last fall, we did some ground penetrating radar there and uh, found a whole lot of submerged Native American um, uh, circular, probably foundation type uh, dwellings there, uh, rings or something. The, the radar could, could measure differences in conductivity, uh, moisture, could see stones, we don't really know, but we're actually finally going to do a little digging there this summer, late summer. It's a historic Revolutionary War vintage site on top of the hill as well. So, um, 
coming up uh, middle of May, we have our uh, one of our twice a year Bay Days. Um, we have about 450 members. Probably about 30% of the members volunteer in some way, which is really high. And May 15th is our Spring Bay Day at the Chop Point School in Woolwich, which if you've never been, you need to volunteer and come to Bay Day to see the site alone. It's the most powerful site on the bay. The bay drains close to 40% of all the water in Maine, and it's all rushing right through that 200 meter slot. It's, just so, it's a so cool spot. And you never know what's gonna pop up, seals, eagles, whatever. Uh, and, and we would love some help chaperoning groups of fourth graders from one hands-on environmental session to the next, whether it's fish printing or a real archeology span dig, or uh, Jerry for many years has done a great I Am Coyote workshop. And uh, so there's lots of fun stuff for the kids to do. And, and you know when a kid says, you know, I don't want to stop for lunch or I don't want to go home, I want to be a biologist or I want to be an archeologist, that you know, maybe you've had a little bit of positive impact that day. So we do those things as well as do in-school projects during the year, in-school visits during the year. As I mentioned, we are a land trust. Um, we've protected well over 1,500 acres of land around the bay, about 11 something miles of shorefront. Um, mostly, well, a mix of conservation easements and, and uh, uh, acquired land that ends up with the state. Um, a lot of our research informs our advocacy. Um, I was talking with John over dinner here about the circulation study. We did over a number of years, there's a poster about it over there, but we use some of those data there to help stop a proposed major tidal generation project that would have been right in the chops, right at the entrance exit to the bay. 50, 50 foot propeller style underwater turbines in the only spot where all these migratory fish go in and out. We were the only group opposed to it outright except for the company's competitor. <laughs> Everyone else said, oh, the bay is an important spot. You gotta go easy, be careful. I'm like, no, we don't wanna spend the next 30 years in litigation. This is a bad idea, let's stop. And we were successful in doing that. So um, what was the term they called, used in the paper for us, Kathleen? Oh, I don't, I don't know, backyard terrorists. <laughs> no, it wasn't backyard terrorists. <laughs> but it, was, uh, it wasn't NIMBYs or anything like that. It was a, it was a, great, it was a great term, but uh, anyway. So, um, so yeah, membership. We do membership membership activities. This is one. We have summer outings and so forth. You know, mushroom walk this summer. We'll be doing the archaeology digs. Have some uh, ever popular Swan Island um, circumnavigations and and on land tours. Um, so research, advocacy, education, um, and conservation. Um, uh, John Davis. I met last year. He was up here speaking on uh, cougar related. Uh, work. We had a cougar presentation last year as well and uh, asked John to come back and he graciously agreed to do that. It's a long haul over here from the Adirondacks and uh, John co-founded the Wildlands Network 25 years ago. He served as the editor of the, the journal Wild Earth for a few years. Um, he's currently the executive director of the Rewilding Institute which he'll tell you about I hope uh, and his duties include advocating for carnivore recovery and critical wildlife corridors through outreach and ultra trekking. So he likes to call himself, or he has been called a long distance conservation athlete. All right, look at that guy. <laughs> so uh, he's an avid naturalist. He grew up in the Eastern forest, was lucky to have a family that appreciated nature, got him outside all the time like my mom did to me, and uh, has had some outstanding conservation mentors sort of deep ecologist and activist Dave Foreman and Michael Sewell. Uh, in 2011, um, John, with uh, sponsorship and guidance from the Wildlands Network and the Rewilding Institute and others, did a marathon trek um, from Florida to Quebec, Trek East, he's gonna talk to us about tonight. And then in 2013, did something similar from down in Mexico up to British Columbia, Trek West. So welcome, John, tonight. Anywhere, you just clips on your shirt anywhere. Doesn't have to be up there, but. There we go. There we go. All right. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you also, Kathleen, for treating me to a delicious dinner and a fascinating conversation. I, and uh, I'm also delighted to see here my old friends, 
young friends, but I've known them for a long time. Speak up a bit, too. I'm delighted to see here also Gary, Gary and Beth of Gulf of Maine Books, two longtime friends, and Jerry, a hero on behalf of Coyotes. <clears throat> and very glad and grateful to see all of you. Um, I was fascinated by our dinner, dinner conversation tonight with, with Ed and Kathleen. I didn't know all these special features about Mary Meeting Bay, but it makes me determined to spend more time here and do more paddling in the area. This is really a, a tremendously beautiful and important natural space you have right offshore here, and I, I applaud all of you for helping protect it. What I'll principally talk about tonight, though, is a long, primarily land-based trek I took in 2011, as Ed mentioned. I spent a lot of time on water also, and as I'll try to draw out from some of my slides, attention to aquatic creatures is every bit as important as is attention to terrestrial creatures. Uh, and I took this long conservation trek in 2011 because I had, as Ed mentioned, I'd been studying for years with conservation luminaries like Dave Foreman and Michael Soule and Reed Noss and Margot McKnight and others who had been saying it's not enough to protect small patches of habitat. We have to protect big, wild expanses, and we need to reconnect those spaces, and we need to restore the missing species so that the natural ecosystems can be healthy. It turns out, as conservation scientists have been showing now for some time, if you remove the top predators from an ecosystem, things start to unravel. So our removal here in the eastern United States of, of cougars or pumas or mountain lions, all the same cat, and wolves has had, has had cascading effects. In fact, conservation biologists use the term trophic cascades to, to uh, crystallize the idea of what happens to ecosystems when you remove the top carnivores. Anyway, I've been hearing these conservation lessons from some very important leaders in conservation biology and activism for many years. And finally, I decided I needed to experience what they had been saying on the ground. I wanted to ground truth, if you will, their teachings. So I, I began <clears throat> under the guidance of Rewilding Institute and the Wild Lands Network this long, a long trek through one of the wild ways that Dave Foreman had earlier proposed. Dave Foreman uh, did this um, very conceptual map oh, about 15 years ago, suggesting that while we need to strive to protect wild nature and restore missing biological diversity everywhere, we especially need to give attention to the places where we have a good chance in the near term of restoring the, f the full native biota. So Dave Foreman and others outlined, really just with faint paint sketches, uh, the most promising continental scale wildways in North America. And as you can see, one of them they identified. It, Dave initially called these the mega linkages until some of us persuaded him that sounded like large sausages. <laughs> and I suggested the more evocative term wildways and that, that eventually stuck. So these days when we, when we use the term wildway, we essentially mean a large scale wildlife corridor that also in most cases lends itself well to human recreation. So a continental wildway is a place where you strive to get maximum protection on the land you encourage quiet recreation like hiking and paddling and fishing and you discourage development and you try to make sure that any extractive uses like forestry and farming are as gentle as possible for the natural world, as wildlife friendly as possible. Especially in the East, but really it turns out even in the West, any continental scale wildway will necessarily include a great deal of private land. And we're not talking about turning everything into wilderness and national parks. That's just not politically possible. We are talking about expanding wilderness areas and national parks, reconnecting them, and then offering private landowners good incentives for being kind to the wildlife on their land. So anyway, this is a, just a quick sketch of of what a continental wildways system for North America might look like. Since Dave, draft, Dave Foreman drafted this map 15 years ago or so, others of us and Dave have agreed we really would want in the long run to have a continental wildway across the Gulf Coast. So linking that eastern one with the western one over the Gulf states and through the Great Plains. And we've also agreed that the wildway ought to be, the, the boreal wildway ought to be broader 
and ought to connect through the Great Lakes area to the Eastern Wildway. So this map will eventually be amended, but this gives a rough idea of what we're talking about when we talk about continental wildways. The trek that Ed mentioned, which came to be known as Trek East, took the line, the meandering line shown here, and as I've said many times before, no, we were not drunk when we mapped this route. We just wanted to experience as many ecosystems and habitat types and meet as many different conservation groups and leaders as possible, hence the very meandering indirect line. It would have been much, much shorter just to hike the Appalachian Trail. That's only about 2,200 miles. The route I took was about 7,600 miles. A lot of that was bicycling, though. I didn't hike all that. A lot of that was bicycling between, and sometimes I would bicycle between wild areas and then hike. I had a great deal of logistical support from various conservation groups along the way. And along the way, we gave slideshows like this one and promoted the idea of an Eastern Wildway, or it's also sometimes called the Appalachian Atlantic Wildway. And we promoted the recovery of missing species, particularly puma, cougar. So that's the, roughly the, the line I took in 2011 to explore the proposed Eastern Wildway. And one thing that I quickly confirmed as I had been reading and hearing for many, many years is that a, a, a fundamental challenge for wildlife across North America and across the world is habitat fragmentation. Occasionally that happens with politically foolish ideas like border walls. This is indeed the, the dreaded border wall between Mexico and the United States, which is sadly blocking wildlife movement and is not blocking drug traffickers at all. It does block wildlife, it does not block people. And then on the lower right-hand corner is, uh, is an answer to the problem of roads. Roads are the single biggest type of, or source of fragmentation, uh, really throughout North America, probably throughout the developed world. Roads are how we get around. We depend on roads for, to connect ourselves with our families, our friends, our jobs. But roads, as many of you know, have very harmful effects on wildlife. They sometimes just outright block wildlife movement. Uh, billions of times a year, they are fatal for moving animals. They cause edge effects. There's a whole science called road ecology about the harms done by roads. Now, we're, no credible conservationist is, clo is call calling for closing all roads, although some of us are calling for closing some roads. But conservationists do urge that we try to make our roads more permeable to wildlife movement. And one of the best ways to do it is to identify where the animals are trying to cross and then through uh, camera trapping studies, track and sign surveys such as Sue Morris teaches over in Vermont and elsewhere, and other research of that sort, then where the animals are trying to cross, put a bridge over or an, an underpass under or preferably both. Uh, to allow animals to cross that, that road. And these, these structures initially are expensive, but they, they are being shown to more than pay for themselves in a surprisingly short amount of time. Often, a, a, a wildlife crossing structure will pay for itself in reduced collisions in 10 years or so. And it, we should remember, when a car hits an animal, it's not only bad, but it's usually fatal for the animal. It's often bad for the car. It's fairly often injurious for the driver and it's occasionally fatal for the driver. And any of, any of you in Maine are very aware of this because thankfully you have a good moose population. If you hit a moose, it's serious for everybody involved. So these wildlife crossings are not only ecologically beneficial in reducing habitat fragmentation and saving individual animal lives, they actually save uh, American motorists money over the long haul. Actually, one other, one other thing I'll say about, about road crossings. Um, I, I happen to have a, a fairly prominent neighbor in the Eastern Adirondacks, the former governor of New York State, George Pataki. And George Pataki, as some of you know, made an aborted attempt to get the Republican nomination last round, didn't get very far, and, uh, the, the, and, and has very little respect for, for the man who did get the Republican nomination and, and is now president, but, he, but George, former Governor George Pataki said he's, he's come to be a very big believer in, in the importance of wildlife habitat connectivity and the importance of putting in safe wildlife crossings. And he said, he called the current president some rather unpleasant words and then said the one thing we might get out of this administration 
of benefit is uh, language and money for wildlife crossings. He thinks that may be a, a case we can effectively make even to what, what is proving to be a pretty hostile administration with respect to the natural world. And I should say, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be partisan here. Uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans and people from any party can be good on conservation, but right, right now, the Trump administration is not being very kind to our conservation and environmental laws or to our public lands or to our, our conservation values. But George Pataki thinks one thing good we might get out of them is, is funding for safe wildlife road crossings, partly because he, uh, Trump is apparently you know, a, a big advocate for more infrastructure, infrastructure spending. So it's something to keep in mind as we wrestle with a difficult political environment over the next few years. Some of the low-hanging low fruit right now may be safe wildlife crossings, which would entail jobs and infrastructure work. Again, I spent more time on land during Trek East than in the water, but I was fortunate to get out in canoes and kayaks quite often, okay, uh, once or twice even a sailboat. And as all of you who live here know, you tend to see a great deal of wildlife when you're on or near the water. Edges, natural edges attract animals. Oceans and rivers simply have a great abundance of wildlife if they're allowed to be at all natural. And th this trek, again, even though I was on land more than on water, really, f for me, underscored the importance of protecting as much, as much shoreline, as much riparian habitat, as much coastline as we possibly can. These really, almost any river, almost any lake, almost any seashore is a high ecological priority if it has any natural amenities remaining. Um, I happen here to be in a, in a modest size a wildlife management area in South Carolina. I think it's called the Donnelly Wildlife Management Area, and just it's just a you know one of countless examples of the abundance of wildlife in natural aquatic habitats. Those dark objects there are not logs; they are alligators, and uh, I, I mean, it's a cluster of 50 or so alligators. And the white spots in the trees are egrets, and I actually saw scenes like this much more often in the Florida Everglades, but. This happened to be the photograph I, I grabbed. But you know, when you have natural aquatic ecosystems, you have great biological diversity. They are always important. So is old growth forest. I have a special affinity for old growth forest, partly because my mother, the late Mary Bird Davis, did a lot of research on eastern old growth forests. So whenever possible on this trek, I would visit old growth forest remnants. And here I'm at. Uh, a big old tulip poplar, hundreds of years old, which I think is simply known by the locals as the great tree. Um, and you can see why. It's just a massive tulip poplar. By Eastern standards, this is a very, very large tree. In, in an area of old growth forest in the Sipsi Wilderness, Bankhead National Forest, northern Alabama. And we should have much more forests like this. I think one of our goals of today should be to, re to restore as much old growth forest as possible. Um, I would recommend for any of you interested in old growth forest books by Joan Maloof, which are available at Gary and Beth's bookstore. Um, Joan has written some really beautiful books. The one I noticed at your shop today is The Living Forest, a coffee table book about the, the beauty of old growth forest. She did a, a smaller volume called Nature's Temples, the complex world of old growth forest, which is a beautiful, simple but, and beautiful summary of the scientific attributes and the ecological values of old growth forest. Very beautiful book. And she and Bob Leverett and others who used to write for Wild Earth magazine have started a native tree society to be champions for old growth forest. And Joan Maloof has started also an old growth forest network. So there's some, there are groups to get involved with if you're interested in old growth forest. You probably know there's not much old, true old growth remaining in Maine, but there is some. The biggest single parcel in Maine, I think, being at Big Reed Pond. Uh, that's a Nature Conservancy preserve. And then the, there's some old growth crumb holes of, on top of Mount Katahdin, of course. This is a red wolf. <coughs> and uh, this, is not, this is probably not the wolf we would have in this area. We would probably have a gray wolf or possibly a Great Lakes wolf, but probably a gray wolf. There are gradations between these wolf subspecies. But I put in, in the slideshow a, a red wolf because in case any of you are not already aware, there has been, until recently, a very successful red wolf recovery program underway in the southeastern United States. It actually 
started before the much more famous Yellowstone wolf recovery. The red wolves were doing quite well in, in the Albemarle Peninsula of eastern North Carolina, coastal North Carolina. They were doing well until some developers decided that the wolves were in the way of development. The wolves are protected, partially protected under the Endangered Species Act. The developers didn't like the headache of having to deal with an endangered species, so they started spreading rumors that red wolves were eating up all the wildlife and that their hunters would shoot, soon have nothing to shoot. This is not at all true. <clears throat> and in fact, I think the studies have shown the red wolves do eat some deer, thankfully, as they should to help keep deer numbers in check, but they, I think, were preying largely on smaller animals. In any, in any case, they're not, they're not ha having a negative effect, quite the contrary, they're having a very positive effect on wildlife health and distribution, but they've been, they've been vilified now quite effectively, and so the Fish and Wildlife Service is basically retreating from this program. It's, the, it's, in, it's in jeopardy right now, and whether it will survive the, the next few years of a of a, an administration not particularly friendly to wildlife habitat or wildlife conservation remains to be seen. But if any of you feel politically motivated to write letters, this is a good species to write for. Letters to the Fish and Wildlife Service urging them to not only continue but to expand the Red Wolf Recovery Program. Th these, these beautiful large canids have not been given enough of a recovery area. They really need a much larger area so they can prosper. They're limited to a small area. And as probably all of you know, we do not have a breeding, functioning, viable population of, of wolves in northern New England. And we would be better off if we did have one. You might appreciate this, Jerry. This is a coyote. And uh, I, put, I do a lot of work in a small wildlife court in the eastern Adirondacks we call Split Rock Wildway, near where you talked a couple of years ago, Jerry. And we put out wildlife cameras just uh, partly to figure out where the animals are trying to move, but really more just to show our neighbors what animals we have in our area to try to build their appreciation for their wild neighbors. This one, I think, is, a, is quite a, a good size coyote. And I suspect this is one of the many coyotes that does have a good bit of wolf genetic material in his or her makeup. And it's a long, complicated story that Jerry could explain a lot better than I, but suffice to say for now, our, some of the coyotes, at least some of the coyotes in our, in our area, do have wolf genes and are sometimes hunting in packs and are sometimes taking deer, which makes them especially important for the health of our forest communities. And unfortunately, coyotes have almost no protection in our region. And again, Jerry could say much more about this. In northern New York, where I live, uh, you can shoot as many coyotes as you want. I just recently found four dead ones on a country road uh, a, a mile from where I live, and I was quite, quite shaken by the experience. These are beautiful animals. They're ecologically important. They should be protected. Again, the importance of aquatic ecosystems cannot be overstated. I'm with a few friends here paddling through an old-growth forest in Congaree Swamp National Monument, I think it is, in South Carolina. Uh, just underscoring the importance again of aquatic ecosystems and old growth forest and broad riparian buffers, protected riparian buffers along streams wherever possible. I experienced a very sad scene when I got to, to Nantahala National Forest in western North Carolina, southern Appalachians, that brought home another a lesson, a rather hard lesson for me. Once invasive species get into an area, it's really hard to get them out. And sometimes they are fatal or nearly so for, for native species or some of the native species. The, the, um, what you're seeing here <coughs> is the aftermath of dynamiting. The hemlock woolly adelgid got into the, the old growth hemlock trees in the Joyce Kill Memorial Forest. In, within the Nantahala National Forest, Western North Carolina. And this, 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 is, a, this is really a sacred grove, old growth grove, very popular with, with, peop with pedestrians, people wa wanting to see big old trees, wanting to experience old growth and walking through it along these designated paths. The Forest Service felt they could not risk the danger of dying hemlock trees falling on the pedestrians. And it's a designated wilderness, 
So they did not feel they could use chainsaws to cut down the trees, so they dynamited them down. <coughs> Rather sad paradox. But the, the lesson here being, we really do need to keep invasive species out, and the best way to do so, or one of the, or one of the critical steps in doing so, is to keep areas free of roads and utility lines and other fragmenting features. A big road-free area is not nearly as vulnerable to invasion by exotic species as is a fragmented area. And, and this, um, though this is a relatively wild area, it does have road access and, pro and fairly likely somehow the, the Adelgids took advantage of those intrusions and got in and killed the hemlock trees. Another part of slowly growing an eastern wildway is to designate more areas as national parks, national wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and other public protection designations. This is uh, part of Dolly Sod's wilderness in the West, Carolina, uh, West Virginia mountains. Um, and it's a relatively well protected area, but it would be still better protected and larger and more cohesive if the different disparate public lands here were consolidated into what has been proposed as a high Allegheny National Park. Uh, Restore the North Woods, led by Michael Kellett, some of you, and Jim St. Pierre, some of you probably know Michael and Jim. They have been a champion not just for the Maine Woods National Park, but also for big national parks in other areas of the country. And this is one of the, this is at near the top of their list, the proposed High Allegheny National Park in West Virginia, which would be a, a big step toward an eventual Eastern Wildway. To, uh, to, undersc uh, to underscore the point that it is still feasible, even here in the heavily developed East, to not just protect but reconnect habitats. I put this uh, land cover image that shows where forests grow in the United States. And as you see, the East has a lot of forests still. We've lost a tremendous amount, and probably most of that green is second or third growth, and some of it's pretty badly fragmented. Still, there is a lot of connectivity, even here in the rather crowded Eastern United States. It's not too late, I ended up concluding from my journey, to protect an Eastern Wildway. But if we don't take some big steps toward it fairly soon, it will be too late. We are, and you've been told this a thousand times, but we are running out of time for preserving and restoring North America's great natural heritage. For folks interested in this region, what the ecological priorities may be in this region, I borrowed a slide from the Staying Connected initiative, and they've identified 10 or so Critical wild ways, they're calling them linkages, but same idea. Uh, 10 or so in our region, as you see, several include good parts of Maine, and I would particularly draw your attention to the big yellow blob that links or should link Vermont's Northeast Kingdom, New Hampshire's White Mountains and Mahusik, and Upper Connecticut River Watershed, and then the Boundary Mountains or Mountains of the Dawn of Western Maine. Uh, this, is a, this is recognized by conservationists across our region as a very high priority, as is the big purple blob north of there, where has been proposed a Three Borders International Peace Park that would take in parts of Maine, Quebec, and New Brunswick, and would center around a little known but really beautiful river called the St. Francis which I, it was described to me by conservationists up there as being almost like a mirror image of the fabled Allagash. A very similar scenery, just as wild, actually probably wilder than the Allagash, um, and, and yet not protected. And so one of the goals of the advocates for this Three Borders International Peace Park idea is to get strong protection on the St. Francis River, probably in part by encouraging more canoeing and kayaking. It's a, a river very welcoming to paddling, and full of, full of opportunities for exploration uh, by paddle craft, and yet not much used for that right now. So this, this was one of the more exciting park proposals I heard about during my excursion a few years ago. I hope to go back and explore that area more. But there are many other regional priorities. These are just some of the ones that were identified. I might mention, since I live in the Adirondack Park, which is Right here, in case any of you don't know, the, that, that too uh, includes parts of several key linkages. 
including the, the link from the Adirondack Park to Vermont's Green Mountains through the southern Lake Champlain Valley. I live just north of that. And then the link from the Adirondacks west to the Tug Hill Plateau. Those are also regional priorities where land trusts and advocacy groups are working to protect as much land as possible and encourage, encourage good private land stewardship. Now I'm going to say more at the end about why I think we really do need to restore cougars or pumas to the east. And some of you may have been at the Cougar Forum that our friends hosted in this area last year. <clears throat> but th this is, and this is one of the speakers at that forum, Chris Spatz. He was my guide during, during my trek in 2011. He was my guide in the Schwangunks, uh, which is a, a forested, relatively natural area in the Catskills, uh, I mean, uh, in New York, near the Catskills, and actually linking or reconnecting the Schwangunks with the Catskills is another regional conservation priority. But why I put this photo in is to make the point that our forests really are suffering from the lack of top carnivores. We have removed the apex carnivores. We, we shot them, we trapped them, we drove them away. We no longer have breeding populations of pumas or wolves in our area, and this is a consequence of that. There's very little ground vegetation. There's not much of an herb layer here. The, the, the few small plants you see are largely exotics, especially Japanese barberry. It's because we have too many deer, and the deer don't need to move around much. They can just sort of stay put and keep munching as long as they want without having to worry about a puma or a wolf sneaking up on them. We really need those top carnivores, not just to keep the deer numbers in check, but to keep them keep them alert, keep them active, keep them moving so they don't overgraze and overbrowse areas. So, so when, if you walk into a, some, often a forest that's been overbrowsed actually looks paradoxically quite pretty. It can look rather open and park-like, almost like a western forest. In the east, that's not really a natural situation usually. We should have a fairly lush herb layer in, in our forest, in our hardwood forest, maybe not so much in conifers where there's a, a, a year-round canopy, but in our eastern hardwood forest, we should have a multi-layer structure, and we've largely lost that in many places because of over-browsing by deer. It's not the deer's fault. Deer are beautiful native animals. They belong. We should be glad they're here, uh, but they need their natural predators, so they're in balance with the forest. Uh-oh. I seem to have just... I think I hit the wrong button. Yeah, I definitely hit the wrong button. I guess I ended it. Well, that's all right. I can make my final points. I was going to show you. Oh, I'll keep talking while I. Um, well, uh, I don't want to waste people's time. Um, I was going to show a few slides from Maine. Probably none of you really need to see pretty pictures from Maine. I would, um, about Maine, I would say you have an exceptionally beautiful state. Protection of lands along the rivers and the coastline is exceptionally important. And you have a, a wide diversity of, of anadromous and catadromous aquatic organisms here. Yeah, there we are. Great. Thank you, Ed. So we just saw that one, so. Even a walleye can do it. Yeah, good. One light that has been surpassed by another. Uh, this, is a, this is just a scene from the southern Lake Champlain Valley connecting the Green Mountains with the Adirondacks. That's the southern end of Lake Champlain down there. The, the man with the hat uh, is or, yeah on the far left. That's Jerry Jenkins. Watch for his Northern Forest Atlas project. Gary, you'll, Gary and Beth, you'll want to carry it once it's out. It's going to be a, a field guide series, books, posters, uh, online presence. These are probably going to end up being the best field guides for uh, for forest communities in our region. They're, they're going to be just outstanding. He's an absolutely brilliant biologist, a legend in the Adirondack Park, but he's doing a, a much a much wider look at the northern forest and writing field guides and descriptions for the area. I urge you to watch for the Northern Forest Atlas Project. There's already uh, quite a presence online of of Jerry's descriptions and photos and art for the area. Again, I want to speak up for old growth forest. And actually, especially since yeah, Gary has just told me about a book that I'm planning, I just bought from the bookstore and I'm planning to read called The Overstory, which I think is largely about 
the importance and the power and the beauty of trees and the people who defend them. In the, in the, on the left there's Joan Maloof. Again, I mentioned her earlier. She's the author of various books on old growth forest. In the front is Rob Leverett. Who, he's the son of the legendary old growth sleuth Bob Leverett. And in the back is uh, Champlain Area Trails land steward Bill Amidon. And we're just poking around an old growth forest in the southern Adirondacks here. But every, every scrap of old growth forest we could possibly save, we should. And wherever possible, we should be restoring old growth forest conditions. This is a badly blurry photo, but it shows the area, the, the local conservation project with which I'm involved is, is linking Lake Champlain and its valley and hills with the high peaks to the west. It's about a 15,000 acre area. Uh, various land trusts have helped protect about half of it so far, it, it, land trusts and the state and we have perhaps another seven or 8,000 acres we need to protect. It's important as a, not just, it's important for many reasons, but including it's an altitudinal, it's an altitudinal connection between the lake and the valley and the mountains. And that may be especially important in a century of climate warming, in the climate chaos century. I just wrote a book about that place called Split Rock Wildway, if any of you are interested in that. We'll be selling that through Rewilding Earth. And Gary, I can get it for your shop if you're interested at some point. Just came out. But it's about the wildlife of Spit Rock Wildway and about how we're trying to conserve it. <clears throat> Again, I want to underscore the, the, the tragedy of roadkill. Really, this is a national tragedy. I think it's one of the darkest parts of our culture. We just, we run over our neighbors almost routinely. I probably ran over a few on my way here, nothing big, but I'm sure I hit a few insects on my long drive here. And it just doesn't, I mean, we're, we're never gonna stop hitting insects as long as we're driving, but we don't have to be hitting rattlesnakes and moose and bears. This rattlesnake was killed just a short distance from my cabin on Lakeshore Road. And there's just no need for this. It's a small population, they cannot afford to lose in fact, I'm, I live right near the northernmost population of rattlesnakes. We don't talk about this in public, but actually some of us see Split Rock Wildway as a way to help the snakes move up as the climate warms. <coughs> we don't call it a rattlesnake corridor, but it may be that. <laughs> but anyway, last summer I found two dead rattlesnakes on Lakeshore Road, and it was just another painful reminder of the tragedy of roadkill and how we need to get safe wildlife crossings for and obviously a snake probably uses a different kind of a crossing from a bear. So they, you, you need many different types of crossings. And if you cannot get crossings in place, education can help. You know, just if you can convince yourself and your family and your neighbors to drive more slowly, especially at night, and especially on those warm spring nights when the frogs and the salamanders are trying to cross. I mean, it's just carnage on those warm spring and early summer nights when the amphibians are moving if traffic is heavy, the, just countless... Uh, frogs and amphibians and salamanders get hit and that we just don't we shouldn't be doing that uh, This is a photo from my land actually I, I help with Northeast Wilderness Trust I protect a small piece of land called Hemlock Rock Wildlife Sanctuary in Split Rock Wildway, and this is one of my neighbor bobcats We again we use these photos to promote coexistence between our human neighbors and our wild neighbors this is a fisher I caught on a wildlife camera near where I live. And you have these same creatures here, of course, and they, they, deserve our, they deserve our concern. Sue Morris, the great tracker with Keeping Track and founder of Keeping Track, likes to um, talk about coexistence with fishers and bobcats and coyotes and river otters. And she really emphasizes the point that these are beautiful members of our neighborhoods and if we can learn to coexist with them, they'll last. But if we don't give them the space or if we persecute them, they won't last. And a, a, a point I have realized on my conservation journeys is that wildlife corridors are necessary but not sufficient. We really also have to change the way we treat wildlife. And we need to, frankly, we need to reform some of the agencies that manage lands and wildlife. By and large, wildlife manage, management agencies in the United States ha, um, have, a, have a style or a, a, an ethic that 
that leads to trying to maximize game numbers, not trying to conserve and restore the full range of native wildlife. And we really need to change that. It, I, I'm not against hunting at all. I, I, I admit I am against steel jaw leg hold traps. I'm not against hunting, but we should not be managing wildlife to maximize numbers of deer and grouse and turkey. We should be conserving wildlife so that the whole suite of our natural neighbors can thrive, including these carnivores like bobcats and fishers, which are very vulnerable to trapping and also get shot. Uh, another regional priority, this is the Israel River. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and this is right near the Bowman Divide, uh, just north of the Presidential Range, southeast of the Kilkenny Range. I've just, I'm just a short distance here off Route 2. So many of you have driven past this area dozens of times probably. If you drive from this area to Adirondack Park, as I just did, you'll probably take Route 2. You'll probably go over the Bowman Divide. That's as high a priority in our region for safe wildlife crossing as any area. We really need to get safe wildlife crossings here. Uh, some of the folks, some of the good folks in Randolph, New Hampshire, have been urging transportation and wildlife officials at the state and federal levels for many, many years to put in a wildlife crossing here. M many, many animals get killed needlessly, and so far that has not happened. Uh, and and it, it bears uh, reiterating, we also, in, along with influencing wildlife officials, encouraging them to be more biocentric or nature first oriented. We also need to influence transportation officials and persuade them to to support safe wildlife crossings and where necessary lower speed limits, especially lower nighttime speed limits. Anyway, this is this is right near the site where a wildlife crossing at Bowman Divide is urgently needed. Uh, some of you some of you probably hiked in this area. This is the Mahusix part of that critical habitat linkage or wildway from Northeast Kingdom of Vermont through White Mountains and Mahusix and here to, to Maine. This is your state. This is uh, a stream running through the mountains of the Don or the, the, the Boundary Mountains of Western Maine. Uh, this is of course Acadia National Park, which is really one of our f country's flagship parks, partly because it, it does have so much water. It has so much oceanfront. It has, therefore, so much diversity. It really is a crown jewel in our national park system, right here in your backyard. Um, this is on the Knife Edge Ridge, Mount Katahdin. Many of you have been up there. I was lucky enough to climb that during a rather blustery and snowy day near the end of my trek a few years ago. One of the best days of the whole outing. It was really just a magnificent, magnificent day. When you're up, as you know, when you're up in the, what do they call it, the fell fields, I think they call them, and Katahdin, you, you can almost feel like you're in the Brooks Range. It really does feel, at least if you get away from the trail and you're not being passed by other people, you can really feel like you're in the Brooks Range. This is the Allagash River. I paddled this with that scientist I mentioned earlier, Jerry Jenkins, and at one point he was scanning the area and seeing these really big, surprisingly big trees along the river, including silver maples and even elm trees, healthy elm trees, perhaps because they're a long way from the diseased elms of more southern places. And at one point, Jerry, and as you know, probably, there's really only a narrow ribbon of protected forest along the Allagash, and you go beyond that, and it's typical overmanaged timberland. But along the river, you have a nice, healthy riparian forest. And at one point, Jerry Jenkins just sort of scanned around and said, this is the lost kingdom of the eastern forest, those big old riparian trees. This is near the end of, uh, of the trek in Gaspésie Provincial Park, Gaspé Pen Peninsula, Quebec. And here is the southernmost population in the east, in eastern North America of caribou. And it, it, they're doing okay, but it's a small isolated population and there's a real danger that what will happen to them is what happens to so many isolated populations. They may eventually wink out because they don't have enough space. They, the, uh, the, the government officials and wildlife officials in Quebec need to give the caribou much more space if they are to thrive in the long run. This uh, park also, at least when I was there a few years ago, still had healthy Atlantic salmon populations. I think it does, I certainly hope so. And here's where I ended that eastern trek in Forion National Park. 
Gaspe Peninsula. And this is one of the several places where I saw extraordinary wildlife, again, largely because of the coast. I was seeing, right there at the end, a very emotional day for me. I was seeing whales and seals and seabirds and dolphins and just a tremendous, oh, and bear scat all over the place, just a tremendous, and lynx tracks, tremendous diversity of wildlife here where the Appalachians dive into the ocean, apparently to reappear in a different form in Scotland. I'm not, I need to check with a geologist about that, but I've, I've been told that. And in case any of you want to read the lessons from that conservation trek, I summarize them and some of the adventures I had in this book, Big Wild and Connected, published by Island Press. And finally, I leave you with an image my friend Rod McIver painted called Cougar Almost Home. If I can convince you of any one thing today, it would be get involved in wildlife conservation, go to the agency meetings, get involved, and advocate for recovery of missing species, especially the cougar or puma. We really need these beautiful creatures back, and our forests will be more beautiful when we bring them back. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and I, if, if we have time, I'm happy to entertain any questions. One, one final thing I want to say is a few of us are reviving something like Wild Earth magazine that, that ran out of resources quite a while back and had to be shut down. We're, we are starting an online publication called Rewilding Earth. It should be up and running within a month or two. There's already some material up at rewilding.org. So please, in the future, start looking at rewilding.org and read Rewilding Earth. Some of Gary's poems will be in there and some writings by other folks you know. And there will be a, just a, tr a tremendous amount of useful and inspiring material about how to save and restore nature across North America and around the world. Again, thank you so much for your time. So, thank you, uh, John. Um, did this go all around? No. Ah, because there's only like four pieces of paper in here. I'll do that. I'll distract you for a minute. Um, I, I do want to. Oh, um, one of the the work we do is really hard, and um, what really got me last year when I heard John's talk on his Western trek was he really uh, spoke a lot.